Welcome to the Strong for Performance podcast, where we give coaches and consultants practical ideas for taking you to the next level in your business and in your life. I'm your host, Meredith Bell. I interview experts who've walked in your shoes and offer real world experience that you can apply to your own journey. Welcome to another episode of the Strong for Performance podcast. I'm your host, Meredith Bell, and I am delighted and very excited to have with me today a very special guest and friend, Koji Makai. Koji, welcome. And let me say, Dr. Koji Makai, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me, Meredith. Well, Koji and I got to meet in person. Many of my guests, I don't have that opportunity, but uh, Koji and I uh, were on uh, at an event together and just really bonded. And we learned so many things that we had in common. And I just knew that I wanted to have him as a guest on my podcast so you can benefit too. Uh, Let me give you a little bit of background before we jump into our conversation. Koji is a performance psychologist, and he's the founder of Koji Makai Worldwide. Now, he is probably the only guest that I've ever had that has two doctorates. Koji is an, <laughs> he call, you call yourself a geek, right? Or a, a, a total nerd. Nerd, yes. So uh, I want to let my guests know, though, about your wonderful expertise because it, it has everything to do with what we're going to be talking about today. So Koji has a doctor of psychology in clinical psychology, and he also has a PhD in Applied Management and Decision Sciences. And I love this, his sole mission for the past 20 years is to use behavioral science to help people thrive. And of course, if they're thriving at work, they're also thriving in the other aspects of their lives. That's right. And so that to me is very special. Koji is an award-winning social researcher as well as the author of several business and self-help books. And today we're going to be talking about his brand new book, which is so timely with what we're dealing with in the current environment with the COVID-19. And the title of it is Disrupted, Resiliently Reintegrating After Stress and Adversity. What a perfect topic, Koji, for us to discuss today. And I'm so excited about going deep with you. I've read your book. I absolutely love the concepts you introduce as well as the practical application parts of it. But before we go into the book itself, I want you to give my listeners an idea of where you came from, what your journey was that brought you to the work you do today. Um, Honestly, the journey for me has been, I I took the long way to get here. And so as a nerd, I've always loved the idea of of studying, especially things that are very scientific, um, discovery. When I was a kid, I loved chemistry class. I loved physics class. There was always something to do, but there were things to test. And so when I moved away from what would be considered the pure sciences and into social science or human science, I started to ask myself, is there a chance for me to test out theories in, 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 social, in the social world? And so that's really what led me towards the field of psychology and really human behavior. Um, I'm fascinated by human behavior, whether it's the, that fascination when people do really well or that fascination when people don't do so well. I generally focus on the areas of, of how I can move more people towards the sides, uh, the side of people doing well. So I, I, love, I love being able to test theory in that way, but also in many ways to create theory because part of our work in the social sciences is to create theory around different types of things that happen in, in our experience. And so I'm really fascinated by human behavior and really at the, at the center of it is the story, the human story. Um, I'm crazy about people's story. 
Uh, my research area or field is phenomenology. I am crazy about the lived experience of people. And so this book and really my work every day is built around that idea of what is the lived story of people in the workplace and how can we make that lived story the kind that is punctuated consistently by thriving. I love that goal. It's, it's so important because so many people struggle um, and sometimes it's needlessly, it's of our own making. And to me, that's one of the really key points you bring out in the book. And we'll get to that. But I want to talk about a different um, idea first. And it's something that people are living with every day these days. It's stress. They're feeling stressed because they've lost their job or they've lost clients that they had lined up, their, you know, or their own health and safety. So you had uh, an interesting uh, reframing of that whole concept of stress that I want you to talk a little bit about. What do you mean by that when you recommend that we reframe the idea of stress and how can stress actually be used to transform our lives? In other words, be used for the good. Right. I think at the, the starting point when you think about stress is to think about the binary nature of stress. There's two sides to stress. One side is what most people are accustomed to, which is distress. This is when the stress that we're experiencing is far more than we are physically, emotionally, spiritually, and otherwise able to handle. It becomes a strain on our human body. It becomes a strain on our psychology and so on. The other side to stress besides your distress, is eustress. Eustress is the kind of stress that we need in order for us to function on a day-to-day -day basis. And so we have to balance our stress every day on that scale of going from distress to eustress, distress to eustress. And there's, there's, each and every one of us has, a, has an amount of distress that we can handle before we break. And so we have to recognize what that breaking point is and do our best to not to get, to try to not to get that far into that process. But really at the heart of it is when you think about you stress, most of what we experience is you stress. You and I sitting down right now in our chairs is you stress. There's stress on our lower back, there's stress on our legs. That's you stress. That's helpful. But if we were to sit in this position for seven hours, for 10 hours, for 15 hours, that eustress could transfer over into distress because then it would be too destructive on our bodies. And part of that is us recognizing the value that stress then can bring, which is we don't grow outside of our comfort. We don't grow unless we're outside of our comfort zone. And that includes even in the middle of stress. And so for me, when I think about reframing my stress, it's asking myself, is this stress helping me further along towards my goals, whatever those goals might be, spiritual goals, emotional goals, financial goals, et cetera? Or is this situation making it more and more difficult for me to function long term? And so the key words there is how much stress we have, number one, and then how long we have that stress. So we have to balance those two things. As we go through what's going on right now with COVID-19, this is a stressor. We can't get out of our house and do most of the normal things that we were doing before. Some of us have lost our jobs. Some of us have clients that are no longer able to work with us because their sales numbers are down and their budgets are being cut. There's all these different types of stressors. Part of the challenge with stress is the idea of control. There are components to everything that's going on right now that I have zero control. And so for me, as a rule, those are things that I don't focus on. If I can't control it, fo focusing on it doesn't really help me. It just adds the, the unnecessary type of stress. But what I can do is reframe the whole situation and ask myself, what is it that I can do? And how is it that we can change the situation on our end so that we can learn more from, the, from what we're experiencing currently? And so the whole reframing idea is, number one, it's important for a person to learn the difference between distress and eustress. And then they have to recognize in what ways they can use the eustress that they're experiencing right now to grow, but also recognize how far the limits are towards their distress. That's a really important distinction that I think most folks probably haven't thought of because when we hear the word stress, to me, we immediately associate it with bad. 
Correct. Negative. And so if someone has that kind of uh, mindset or association, let's say, with the word stress, what would you suggest they do to, in order to shift and make that, do that reframing that you're recommending? I think the shift starts, you know, the shift or the transformation really starts here. And once we get it there, we can get it down here into our heart so that we can realize this is something that's completely out of my control. If it's out of my control, it doesn't mean that it's going to move out of my consciousness. It just means that there isn't anything I can specifically do with that component of what I'm considering to be stress. What I can do is my reaction to it. Most stress re researchers will tell you the issue is not stress itself. The issue is our reaction to stress mm -hmm. because stress is this is for most of us, we're experiencing the same thing. If you could think about it from that perspective, take two people who've both lost their jobs. Mm -hmm. That's the same stressor. How they react will determine what direction they'll go, but also the value that stress is going to bring into their lives. If I lose my job and I use it as an excuse or an opportunity to self-destruct, then I've allowed stress then to overcome me rather than me being a little bit more overcoming of the stress. Yes, I'm going to go through the distress and the, the hardship of recognizing I've lost my job, my, my source of income, being able to take care of my family. But ultimately, I have to make that decision of what I do now that I've discovered that this thing is absolutely stressing me. What are my next steps? And unfortunately, most times when stress comes in, most of us don't think about next steps. We're stuck in that moment and in that situation of whatever that stress producing issue might be. It's getting that, it's getting our minds all worked up. Correct. And so thinking about that, uh, what have you found to be some useful strategies, tips, uh, suggestions that could be helpful to the listeners that are feeling this kind of intense stress right now, what are some things that they could do that will help them to shift uh, to feeling more of in, in control and less, when our minds are so cluttered and worried, we can't think clearly. So what are some things they could do to help clear the mind so they can, um, see their options more easily. I would say the first thing is to give yourself permission to feel. Uh, I need to give myself the permission to feel distressed, to feel angry, to feel confused, to feel disappointed, and any other emotion. We have that right. We are emotional beings. Hiding our emotions in this situation actually makes things worse. So I need to give my permit myself permission to feel what I'm feeling. Mm -hmm. That's number one. But I also have to be able to give myself, myself grace enough to know that the things that I'm feeling are normal and are natural. So once we get past those two things, we've dealt with the emotional components of the stress, the stress experience. Everything that you and I experience as a human being enters at the back end of our brains. Um, and in that area is where all the emotions are. For most people, that experience stops right there in that emotional center. It never penetrates forward to get to the prefrontal lobe. Once we get to the prefrontal lobe, we say, yes, this is absolutely stressful. I am angry right now. I'm disappointed. I don't have a job. But now I have to ask myself, okay, what did I do to get myself here? N not really anything. Okay, what can I do to get myself past this? Now I'm, I'm using the logical components of my brain which is allowing me to walk through this process where I feel everything that I need to feel, but I'm also doing the daily psychological work of improving my experience. Because until I ex improve my experience, stress will always be this threat that I'm trying to run away from. I'm not going to run away from, from stress because I know that I can't grow without it. But I also recognize that it's a balancing game because too much of that stress would actually become extremely destructive for me. So before I get to that point, I have to reconcile each and every one of these areas, both the thought components or the logical side of stress, but also the emotional effects of stress. And so when you do those two things, you're giving yourself the leeway and the permission to be human. In the middle of everything that's going on, many of us feel as if we have to be super or extra human. 
But the truth is that's just impossible and unrealistic. We are feeling what we're feeling. We need to recognize it. And once we recognize it, now we have to do something with it and about it. And we have to figure out which of those components comes first and what works best for me in my situation. Mm -hmm. So again, give yourself grace because this, these are really common, common times, but un, in, during an un, uncommon situation. But also give yourself permission to feel everything you need to feel. Um, I heard someone last week share that essentially what we're going through is basically like the grief process, right? We're angry, then we negotiate, we go through all those. Every one of us should experience that grief before we get to the point of acceptance. And once a person gets to acceptance, now they can focus on very clear and specific things that need to be done in order for them to traverse this experience um, with much more dignity. Mm -hmm. That's really helpful because I think sometimes uh, people can lay the shoulds on themselves. I shouldn't feel this way. I shouldn't, you know, I should be stronger. I should do this. And I love what you're saying about just allow yourself give yourself permission to be where you are and then realize the power you can take back for yourself. Absolutely. Seeing what your choices are. So that's really helpful. And it ties in with the next area I want to really delve into because you, you spend, I guess it's about half of the book talking about this idea of narrative yes. and and I, I see you light up when, when I just say that word because I could feel just reading your words about it, how passionate you are about this. And just kind of in laying the groundwork, there are three types of narratives that you describe, what we tell ourselves, what we tell others, and then what we say about our circumstances. So this loops back to what we've been talking about related to stress. So let, talk a little bit about what do you mean by that when you say narratives, and, and especially in those three arenas? So interestingly, um, human beings are storytellers. Depending on your belief system, from the moment humans came on this earth, we've always tried to tell some version of a story. Whether that's depicted on walls today or it's in books, we love a good story. Uh, that's the reason we love good movies. And that's why we hate bad ones, because the good ones reel us into this amazing story and narrative. And that narrative is relatable. That's why any movie or any show that you enjoy, there's going to be a character that you relate to, good, bad, or indifferent. For those 30 minutes, for that hour, for those two hours, however long it is, you're engrossed in this story and you feel what they feel to some degree. You see what they see to some degree. You take that out of the theater and you bring it into the theater of real life. No one experiences my story like I do. And so I have a script that I had written down for my life. In fact, let's use today. I had a script that I had in mind for my day today. And most of us, as we go through that day, continuing to add the pieces to our script for the day, anything that comes in and distorts that script is a stressor. So when our, when our stressors come in, they change the direction of our narrative. We feel as if we're not telling the story that we initially wanted to tell, and mm -hmm. this situation is making things difficult. Mm -hmm. so the people that have built resiliency, they know how to change the, the direction of their narrative, to flow with everything that's going on so that they can get to the other side. It's just like us trying to drive from one city to the next and we discover one road is closed. Well, we reset our GPS or our GPS resets itself and gives us an, an alternative direction. That is much easier to happen than the narratives that we have internally because the narratives we tell about ourselves are directly impacted oftentimes by our circumstances. So COVID-19 right now for people who may have lost their job or people who are on the verge of losing their job or losing their homes or losing anything, the first concern and fear, unfortunately, is going to be how is this going to impact the story I've been telling other people about me? How am I going to start seeing myself? And part of that seeing myself is a narrative we tell ourselves on the inside. I'll give you examples of the narratives we tell ourselves about ourselves. I, I am kind. I am a good person. I am uh, sensitive. I am interested in what other people have to do. I am good at my job. Those are all narratives that we tell ourselves that are 
extremely uh, complex stories. And so each of these stories and these narratives directly impact how we feel about ourselves, but they also either insulate us from the difficulties of stress or they allow us to become vulnerable to those difficulties of stress. So those three areas you were talking about, the story I tell about myself, the story I tell um, other people, and then of course, the story that I tell about my circumstances, I, I love to listen to people. I can almost tell within the first five to 10 minutes, a person's mindset, depending on how they tell this, their own story about themselves, about other people, but also about their circumstances. Some people right now are saying that this is the worst thing that's ever happened to them. And honestly, it may be. But again, it's all perspective. This is certainly impacting our entire world, right? We've got COVID-19 on our collective consciousness as, a hum as humanity. Some people are seeing this as a golden opportunity for relationships to be nurtured, for relationships to be mended, for relationships to be augmented. Other people are seeing this as an opportunity for them to change the way they've been doing business. Um, I think about the narrative transformation that's happening for some of my friends who are restaurateurs. Mm. My friends are now not just still cooking, but they're cooking fewer things and their sales are still generally better than what they would have been if they had just shut down. Uh, my friends are selling eggs as part of their package. They're selling toilet paper as part of their package. Folks are thinking completely outside of the box, and it's because of this experience right now. So the story and the narrative that they're telling about their circumstance will be very different than a person who chooses, because again, part of that is choice, who chooses to lie down and say everything is just falling apart. I can't control anything anyway. So narrative is very, is, to me, is extremely central to our growth as human beings. And because of that, it's usually the target of all our stressors because you and I have a narrative about our work. And when situations come in that take away from that narrative, we get angry, we get disappointed, we, get, we, we experience all these different emotions. But if we can allow ourselves to see that a narrative transformation is a normal and healthy thing for us to do, all we're doing is strengthening our narrative. Imagine, imagine watching a movie that technically never ended. It just went into different episodes and different versions, but it got better as it continued moving forward. That's essentially what narrative transformation does for us because then it takes a situation that's potentially stressful and gives us an opportunity and a platform for us to grow. Mm -hmm. So let's look at um, that first one about the narrative we tell ourselves about ourselves. What's a, an example of a narrative that someone might tell themselves that could take them down a negative path versus someone who's telling a different story to themselves that could take them, you know, accelerate their progress? Well, one of the things you alluded to already, which is these are the things I should have done, I could have done, I would have done. None of those things are helpful in today's situation. They're not. Um, very specifically right now, that's not going to help me. What I need to do right now is figure out where is the next safe place for me to put my feet so that I'm on solid ground. Then I can start thinking about what happened in the past and how I can use th that past experience to write a different story for today, for tomorrow, for the next three hours. And so for most people, the thing that they will think about oftentimes the most is I'm a failure. I can't take care of my family. I can't take care of my friends. Um, there's some people right now who are still working full time and they're a teacher at home full time. And they're discovering that they can't do both. Not that they won't do both, not that they're incapable of doing both, it's that they cannot do both because those are two full-time jobs and they're, somewhat, they're, some, they're trained in one and not the other. Even friends who are in education are thinking the same thing, they, even, even if they teach in that grade that their child is in, right? Because the situation all of a sudden has changed where all those things are happening in one particular setting. It makes things really, really difficult. And it's easy for those folks to feel as if they are failures. They're failing their kids. They're failing their company because they can't keep up with both things. But the truth is you have to be able to find grace. But most times we will, we will generally go towards that negative self-talk. And that negative self-talk only 
strengthens the position of stress. It basically says, yep, stress is really revealing to me that I'm incapable anyway, that I never really was good at this. And then that continues to spiral and becomes this big web that you, it's very, very hard to get out of. So let's just, per, that's helpful thinking about someone in education in that circumstance. Let's imagine, because so many of my listeners are in uh, a service profession similar to what you do. Mm -hmm. They have clients who've hired them to often meet in person with leaders to conduct a training class or do coaching for them. And that has stopped. So let's look at the narrative related to circumstances. Yeah. So if I'm one of those coaches whose clients have just canceled for the next three months, any projects for me, what if you and I were having it and let's have a conversation, what would you say to me that could be encouraging about how I view my circumstances and my narrative around my circumstances? Think of the center of circumstances. I think of circumstances as, as extremely neutral. Um, as a human being, I get to come in and flavor them with positivity or negativity. All of us are experiencing this. We didn't cause it, but we're experiencing it. Um, I've been prevented from doing my work for multiple reasons. Um, those reasons don't necessarily matter at this point. It's that I've been prevented from being able to do the thing that I normally do with my clients. This is an opportunity now for me to start thinking in different perspectives. In what ways can I still serve my clients? I may not be able to get the same amount of um, revenue from what I, as I was getting before, but in what ways can I be a tool and a vessel that can be used to benefit my clients? That could be a free webinar that I get to talk to them and keep up with them and re remain top of mind with them and nurture that relationship. Or it could be a paid webinar that we put together because now they, they don't necessarily have more time on their hands. It's that they need to be able to have some version of development going, even if they're not able to meet together at work and be in one place. So it allows me then to start thinking very differently about my own business because the alternative is, oh, we're not going to get any kind of revenue coming from this anyway, so we might as well just not do anything. Um, that's not an option for me. Um, our clients still need us. So now I have to find different ways to serve them. So if I'm in the service industry, I have to ask myself, in what ways can I pivot my message so that it becomes more relevant to them? I can't do things like I used to because then I'd be tone deaf to the situation. But instead, I can adapt a little bit more and collaborate with my client and help them find ways to remain engaged because right now people need hope more than they need anything else. In what ways can I bring that hope? Right? With technology, say you're in the service industry and you, you service some version of technology, in what ways can you help your clients think about technology in a way that helps them do their work more efficiently? That's a service people will pay for. People still have to pay for Zoom. People still have to pay for their internet. People still have to pay for all these different components of running their businesses and their lives. So in what ways then can I serve them in those areas so that I remain a person that brings value? And it's in these times that we ask ourselves, is what I do really valuable? And that's a good question to ask because even in the best of times, we want to ask that question. And most of us in this industry or any, almost any other industry will realize that there's so much that we do that's extremely valuable. It's valuable to our customers, it's valuable to our clients, and if it's valuable to them, they will pay for it. The challenge is right now, some of them cannot pay for it. So in what ways can we still collaborate that we can continue our work together? Mm -hmm. And those are the questions for me that really bring us to that point where we start to look at our circumstances very differently because we try to use a very Socratic method of asking ourselves difficult questions, but honest ones. And when we look at the whole picture, we realize these circumstances will come and go. But the, those of us who are going to remain in the middle of all of this are those of us who have thought through what comes next. And so part of us recognizing and dealing with circumstances is us asking ourselves what comes next after those circumstances. Mm -hmm. That's such a good point. And I also like the fact that you are 
advocating reaching out to those clients if they've contacted you and said we've had to cancel this particular program to be able to go back to them and explore where is it that people are needing help at this moment like you said hope is a key element of that there may be some other issues that when you ask the questions and listen carefully you'll discover some ways that you can be of service to them, whether, as you said, they can pay right now for those services or not. When we can look at ways to add value, be of service, people remember that. They Absolutely. Know when you have helped them during the, the down times, you're not just staying top of mind by being there. You're actually doing something that's helpful for them. Yeah. We, you know, we're in this together. And that sounds like a catchphrase, but we really are. I do my work because I care very deeply about our clients. Um, I am extremely passionate about their success and about them thriving. This is the best time and probably the right time for me to really test um, that particular viewpoint, that assumption. Mm -hmm. Do I really care about my clients? This is the time that shows whether I really do. Um, I've always believed that stress and adversity come into life or into our lives to test us to see whether we are ready for the next level. Um, some people get multiple tests because there's multiple stressors that come. But just like circumstances, I think of circumstances as hot water. I'm a tea drinker. I love hot tea. I grew up on hot tea. I'm still trying to get over this thing called, you know, iced tea because it's just different. Why would I boil the water, put a tea bag in, and then put ice in? It's just backwards. But I don't know the flavor of my tea until I put the tea bag into the hot water. And we're in hot water right now. Every single one of us has to decide whether this hot water is going to reveal our strengths, reveal our flavor, or it's going to show that we have no flavor and we have no strengths. And that's what stress comes in to do and adversity. They come in to reveal our flavor. That's a choice we get to make. And so I have a personal idea that every time stress comes in, I am going to show the world, I'm going to show myself that I am ready, number one, and number two, that I've got the right flavor for whatever this particular situation is. And so most of us during this season, our flavor is going to be revealed to us. Um, I saw a poster that said, complaining is not a strategy. Very, very true. There's a lot of complaining right now. There's a lot of um, finger pointing. There's a lot of blaming. There's a lot of strategies that people are using that are terrible strategies because knowing who caused this and knowing who did this doesn't change my business. It won't. But what will change my business is me picking up the phone and doing something that, is very, that's, that I'm, I may not have done before. FaceTiming with my clients, getting on a Zoom call with my clients, calling my clients instead of emailing them. There's all these different things that we can do that, we, that can create new touch points. But ultimately, it's the humanity of being able to check in on your clients. I have several in New York and New Jersey. So we've been on the phone checking in on each other, me meeting their family because we can FaceTime. All these different things that without this circumstance, we may not have been able to do because I meet, meet with my clients in their office. I never get to see their family. Mm. But now I get to be on calls and get to meet families and get to meet children and get to meet spouses. Mm -hmm. There's a different connection that you have with people at that level. And so if I was in business or a person, you know, for a person in business, that makes perfect sense to me. That's something that you can add as a new layer to what you do because now the bonds and the tightness that you have with your client are the kind that are just so different. No other vendor can have that. In fact, your client probably won't ever call you a vendor after that. They see you as a friend. Mm -hmm. And so we do have an opportunity here to strengthen those bonds and to strengthen those relationships. And we just have to make that choice. Well, you, um, you mentioned the word neutral, and I want to come back to that because I think that's, it may be foreign uh, to some people to think in terms of neutral because we're used to judging something as good or bad. Yes. But I love the fact that in your book, you also talk about circumstances being neutral and how we view them as, 
is really determined by the lens that we are looking through. And so what I'd like to get you to talk a little bit is how can someone apply that idea of neutrality today in the midst of all the disruptions that we're seeing around COVID-19? Um, so for me, the neutrality con concept is, it's a helpful psychological tool to take my time before I judge. Because sometimes I will make a judgment and it'll turn out to be completely out of the realm of true reality, or it could end up being completely wrong. Asking more questions allows me to judge something with a lot more fairness, with a lot more openness. So when I remain neutral to a situation, I neither like something nor dislike it. I just need to get more information first. It allows me to have an openness for a little bit longer. But if I judge a situation as completely unfair, completely stressful, completely disruptive or destructive, immediately that I experience it, then I haven't given that situation a chance for me to, to discover perhaps there's something here for me to learn. And if something comes into my life to teach me something, then it's not negative. It's a positive thing. But I get to determine in which box it goes into, the positive or the negative box, because when it comes in, it's immediately neutral. It, there's, there's no care to it. Think about this. COVID-19 doesn't care whether we are rich or poor, tall or thin, or whatever it is. It doesn't care, right? It's, it's, it doesn't care. For us, we have to have a little bit of that don't care mentality where we come into a situation and say, I am going to take my time judging this person or this thing so that I know more. And when I make my judgment call, it's based on facts. Yes, I'm going to throw what I feel in there as well, because most of our judgments and our decisions are, are emotional. Most people say, well, I'm buying a car because it's the most economical vehicle. That may be true, but the vast majority of our decision making is based on an emotional decision. I have to weigh and balance out the, the, the logic as well. So as people are going through this right now and experiencing this, they have a choice when it comes to the things that are neutral, the things that are challenging, the things that are, that are difficult. They get to decide whether things are going to be neutral, and then they layer on top of, on, on that, on positivity or negativity. I see that as so important when we think about whether we're going to feel stress about a given situation. If we're walking into it with this idea of, okay, this is happening. And it seems to me that's tied to acceptance. You know, we're not arguing with or fighting it. We're looking at here's what's happening. And therefore, based on what's happening, what choices do I have? Yeah. What would I like to consider? And I really like your idea of staying open to more information that can then inform our decision about where we want to go. It, to me, it ties back to what I was saying earlier. Our minds get uh, stressed when we, and then we can't think clearly. And so we're nowhere near neutral yeah. in, in looking at the situation. It seems like we can allow our thoughts and our feelings to override that it's that back of the brain versus the front of the mm -hmm. brain again. And Absolutely. so if I'm hearing you right, being able to maintain that neutral posture requires using the front part of the brain. Yeah. It's, it's work. That's, that's the truth. And, and maybe that's really at the center of, of the book itself is when we're willing to do the work, the rewards are immense that we can be in a situation like this and not be losing our minds. Um, I, I work from home anyway, so most of this is not uh, disruptive to me. What's disruptive is not being able to get on a plane and go work with my clients. Um, what's disruptive is clients having to freeze any kind of purchase orders. That's, that's disruptive. Um, I've got a team and a staff that my job is to take care of them and to lead them and to shepherd them correctly. It's a little bit hard to do that when you don't have the revenue or the revenue is, has been stalled to take care of them. So obviously those are things on my mind, but ultimately my biggest issues is not being able to do things like I normally can. And so for most of us, that's what we're experiencing right now is we're not able to do the things that we 
we're accustomed to doing. And if we're not able to do the things that we're accustomed to doing, it makes things so much more difficult because again, we come back to that narrative, that story is being distorted, that story is being stalled. So at the heart of it, what we want to do then is put ourselves in a position of growth. And part of that position of growth is that recognition that yes, I cannot control my circumstances, but I can, I can control my reaction to them. Um, stressors are going to come whether things are going good or they're going bad. My job is to use those stressors as tools for my growth mm-hmm. in every area of my life. And in that process, then I can look at my circumstances and say, hey, what is it that I need to learn from this situation? What's happening right now? What is the world conspiring? What are situations and circumstances conspiring to teach me about myself, about my community, and about the people around me? Once I learn that, then I've taken the value and I've milked the value out of this situation rather than saying, well, this situation makes me stressed. I really don't want to be around people now. Um, Everything seems to be falling apart. But instead, we start to build more energy because what we need to do right now as we're going through this is to build momentum. However long this situation takes, we're going to get out of it. I'm hoping people will already have the momentum once we get out rather than trying to build the momentum now that we're out. So this is the time and the season to do all our growing so that when we get to the end of this difficult and challenging time, we're, we're the most prepared for whatever's coming in the future. That's excellent advice. And it's a good note to uh, close on. We could go on, I know, for (laughs) an extended period because you have so much wisdom and there are so much more that you address in the book around this. I love the title, Disrupted with an Exclamation Point, (laughs) because that's how so many, uh, you know, folks are feeling these days. And uh, your new book is out April 16th, correct? Correct. And so I want to encourage everyone to grab a copy of that. Uh, There's so much in there that Koji explains and shares that I think will be valuable for everyone during this time. So Koji, as we wrap up, let people know how can they connect with you? How can they get your book and learn more about the services you offer to your clients? Um, The easiest way is through our website. Um, It's kojimakai.com and it's K O Z H I. M-A-K-A-I.com. And all the information for our books is there, um, contact information as well. Um, we certainly love to hear from people and engage with them. And so that'll be the best way for them to reach us. That's great. And Koji has other books too, and you can find those on his website, as he mentioned, and also on Amazon. Koji, thank you so much for being a guest on my show today. You've shared so much that you've learned yourself over your years of your own personal growth, but also uh, what you've experienced with the research you've done with leaders, as well as the work that you've done in your coaching, consulting, and training with people in all walks of life and all kinds of organizations. And thank you for synthesizing that so beautifully in your new book. Thank you so much. And I appreciate you having me on the show. Thanks for tuning in to the Strong for Performance podcast. Now head over to growstrongleaders.com to learn how our tools can increase your impact with clients and expand your business. And while you're there, grab our free ebook, The Five Secrets to Getting Better at Anything. Until next time, I'm Meredith Bell. Make it a great day.